the knowledge base of what we do in medicine needs to have advanced to the point where you understand what a cell secretes, how cells communicate, and what growth factors are, and what an exosome is, and the different types of things. The medical industry as a whole, and in particular, I think Big Pharma, realized very early on that cell therapy was the way the human body works, and they had to get ahead of the narrative before the science of using your cells to help you heal got kind of out of control. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Wade McKenna. Uh, we're here today with the Zero Downside podcast once again. It's exciting to be back. I know we took a little bit of a break because we were right in the middle of rollout and on the lab side with peptide therapy. And the fact that we've finally finished that and have made dramatic strides on changing the access and availability of peptide therapy to patients is why we were so anxious to get back in the studio and start talking about the different things we can help people with. Uh, one of the big questions I get a lot on when we talk about BPC-157, pentadecapeptide-157. It's 15 amino acids isolated from gastric secretions in the stomach for the first time. But now we know that BPC-157 is also secreted as part of the myosecretome, uh, meaning that muscle, contractile muscle, is, is intimately um, involved in the production of BPC. One of the questions I get a lot is what made me interested in BPC? How did, how did I find it? And really, when we talk about it as a gateway to other peptides, in your mind of opening up the mind to think outside of the functional constraints of, of Western medicine, it was in wound care. There was a significant amount of time and effort in my career as an orthopedic surgeon, fellowship trained in trauma and post-traumatic reconstruction that was about chronic wound management in patients that have had significant multiple injuries, a lot of scarring, dramatic pain, and failure of wounds to heal. And I would get thrown in the middle of a situation where the patient was complete, completely nutrient deficient not managed optimally to improve their ability to try to heal and recover from not only a surgery, but from secondary scarring, just from the injury itself. And in the wound care market, BPC-157 had already kind of found a home um, a decade ago. Athletes were the first to adopt it because of the pain and inflammation part of it. There's, they talk about the complications and side effects possible with peptide therapy. The complication and side effects possible that are not only possible, but probable on the narcotic analgesic side of pain management and the anti-inflammatory side with that going to leave and, you know, poking a hole in your stomach and, and making you sick and affecting your GI tract and putting you in little GI distress or the narcotics, shutting down liver function, hurting renal function, maybe missing some work, maybe being nauseous, maybe having some GI disturbance, maybe nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, kind of shutting down the GI tract. All those opioid and opioid-like and analgesic problems with pain management are real. And pain medicines for a really long time are something that you would like to avoid. They for sure can cause changes in your personality, your interpersonal relationships, your sexual function, mental cloudiness, your cognitive impairment is all real with, with pain management. None of that is a side effect of BPC. So with BPC-157 for pain and inflammation, which is what most athletes use it for, they're injecting it closer to the side of pain because we're trying to get an anti-inflammatory effect or a tenogenesis effect or decrease the fibroblastic effect. 
all the science behind how the peptide would work is really easy to follow. It, it's stepwise in the healing of a wound. It involves angiogenesis and the growth of new blood supply. And I have zero problem walking people through the science of that. I think that when you, when you go to most Western media, the things you hear about BPC is that it's banned by the FDA, which I don't even really know what that means anymore because it's not really banned by the FDA. They, they tried to criminalize it by making it where compound pharmacies didn't have real access to make it anymore. They, it's not a drug. And so the FDA, but the safety efficacy concerns that they threw at it because it's made from bulk source components, most of that's not real. When you talk about safety and efficacy, when you're comparing it to narcotic analgesics, when you're comparing it to Tylenol, what destroys your liver function, you know, in very low doses. I mean, the toxic dose of Tylenol is three, three and a half grams a day. So when you compare it to what else is out there and, and what everyone is using, the risk-benefit ratio changes quite a bit. The whole... The whole MO of the zero downside was how do we find simple, easy, elegant solutions for people to really difficult problems? Peptide therapy falls into our lap really quick when it comes to a simple, easy, elegant solution to what can be really complex problems. BPC as an angiogenic promoter for chronic wound care and inflammatory changes and pain has been really well studied, um, very well understood, and is probably the most common use of BPC in our practice. It's, it was the gateway for me to looking at a lot of other peptides because of the wound care market. BPC and wound care, was the results were fairly startling, and I wanted access to that type of care for patients, and I had to go down a pretty significant rabbit hole to find available peptide therapy that I could write for a patient and make this even available to them outside of kind of the Western medicine paradigm of care, which is more about just restricting access. And, and it's very paternal in a, in, a, in a bad way. I don't think that paternalism in and of itself is wrong, that treating someone like you know what's best for them. But I, but I do think that the paternal attitude of Western medicine is is inherently wrong, and it's usually done to, to marginalize segments of the population or people with a certain issue or a problem, because if we paternalize it, we know what's best for you. We don't need to explain it. No, you need to explain it to me, because you don't know what's best for me. I, you, may, you may actually not even care what's best for me, which is, I think, the general construct I'm to now is they really don't care what's best for you. They care what's best for their financial statement. They, they certainly have to trash other forms of care that have much lower side effect profiles and significant safety profiles on their side of the alternative care and significant long-term results. To pretend like that doesn't exist is wrong and falls outside of the medical narrative of what would be considered health information. But we get, we get downgraded all the time and, and canceled over medical misinformation of peptide, oh, you're talking about an unapproved substance that's illegal. It's not illegal. Peptide therapy isn't illegal in and of itself. Do they try to paternalize it and say, you have to have a documented medical need? That's a doctor-patient decision. If your medical need is you want your hair to be thicker, do you have to have alopecia areata and be bald for that to be a legitimate healthcare need? No. You have to not be comfortable with the hair or the growth or your skin or the appearance or your skin color. Those are genuinely accepted medical needs of a patient, and I can help you address that with peptide therapy. It doesn't have to be a life or death type of injury. You don't wait for a life or death injury to take most over-the-counter or prescription medications. And you shouldn't look at peptide therapy 
much differently than that. I, I, I would look up on peptide therapy as the next generation of nutritional care. It's much, I would never think of the homeopathic application of, of peptides. When we write people for peptide therapy, we're not hoping that it doesn't cause a side effect, but you may not know that it works. I'm treating a problem or an issue you have, and I'm hoping for a general a result without a complication rate. That's how we decide on the doses of peptides. That's why I can't tell you what, how much to take of some bottle you got on the internet or how much to take of some bottle that you got from someone in the gym. I don't know what's in it. In general, well, the guy at the gym said, do 0.1 cc of it. I'm like, what is that dose? Like, how much did he weigh? Like, who told him that that's what he should take? How much did he weigh? What's the concentration in the bottle? What was the formula? Like, we know all that if I have more access and control and I'm willing to put forth all the extra effort to help you obtain a result outside of institutional medical care. And that's our goal. That's our goal with BPC-157. That's our goal with genuinely access to all the peptides that we've worked so hard to get you access to. But to do a real quick down and dirty on BPC. BPC is mostly thought of as in the wound care, recovery from orthopedic injuries, tried to stay out of an orthopedic surgeon's office, treat pain, inflammation, injecting it closer to the site. But remember, the site of pain and source of pain may be two different things, so you could even be injecting one. But the data is pretty anecdotal that if, you, you know, if it's my elbow and I inject it close to the elbow, people do. You don't got to stick it right in the joint. It's a subcutaneous injection. We show you how to do these in the office. We show you how to pull it up. We make sure that you have the needles, the alcohol, the bottles, the containers. You understand the dosing. We work really hard on maintaining that because that's why the results need to be more uniform is the application of care needs to be uniform. We're not hoping for you to not notice the difference. We're treating you with a goal in mind and a specific symptom. The best use of BPC in our clinic is before bone marrow procedures. We do a lot of stem cell procedures using bone marrow aspirate. I haven't done a rotator cuff or a knee scope without bone marrow aspirate concentrate in over a decade because I think it's, it's not criminal, but silly to have someone asleep, stick a scope in their knee, do a procedure that's never been shown to make a difference in the health of cartilage or growth of cartilage in the joint because arthroscopy does not grow cartilage in the knee. But bone marrow aspirate concentrate has been shown in many studies to make a dramatic difference in the overall cartilaginous healing and growth in, into a joint. And to have someone asleep, when I could make one little poke hole to draw marrow aspirate, turn the raw bone marrow into bone marrow aspirate concentrate while you're having your knee scope, and at the end of the knee scope, take that and inject into your knee, lowers your risk of infection down to about zero in every study published using bone marrow aspirate concentrate at the time of surgery, and dramatically changes the healing, time to recovery, amount of pain, amount of swelling. And those aren't just my thoughts. That's really well documented in over 6,500 papers. There's great rotator cuff data to show that the failure rate of rotator cuff surgery is 30%. If you add bone marrow aspirate concentrate, the effect falls down to nothing at six months. So I, I think that in traditional surgery, bone marrow aspirate concentrate is clutch. And, and we've made really good use of that in a very passionate business model for a really long time. Where does BPC come in on that? BPC, and one of the primary things that BPC-157 does is it changes the quality and health of your overall marrow aspirate. Your stem cells do better. You have more of them, and it propagates overall marrow health. It's myeloproliferative, where you see healthy, better quality cellular function. It helps relieve oxidative stress on the cellular pathways, those cellular pathways are your way to generate better marrow. And those are the pathways I'm, constant, I'm, I'm counting on to help get you through a, surg a surgery and get full recovery. So in our practice, we make sure that before we take marrow from people, I try to make sure that they had a couple doses of BPC in that week before because it's pretty well published that it changes your 
health of your marrow aspirate. And if good marrow is better, and it is, then anything I can do to help your marrow be better and healthier should help you be better and healthier. In the wound care market for pain, anti-inflammatory effect, overall recovery and healing, the slang of BPC-157, they call it the Wolverine molecule all the time. I think the reason for that is because anyone that's watched X-Man, um, and I'll throw up the X for Des Bryant, not for X-Man, but Des throwing up the X. Um, I think that if you watch, you know that the Wolfman's, the Wolverine's superpower is healing. If BPC-157 kind of got this cult following to help people recover from injuries they were having trouble recovering from, that's not, that, that's not me. That is the literature out there anecdotally from thousands of patients that saw that as a direct result. That's my experience with it as a, as a patient and as a surgeon and in someone helping people through the recovery from chronic and, and, and long-term kind of multiple surgery kind of injuries that we were guiding people through the recovery from. I use BPC around my right shoulder pretty much every morning. It makes a huge difference. I don't have a cuff on my right shoulder. There's not a lot of other options. I have really good function. I have good strength. If I replaced my shoulder without a cuff, I, there's certain things I might not be able to do. And I'm not ready for that when I can use BPC and it makes a dramatic difference in my ability to function throughout the day and I'm not on any other pain medicine. So BPC makes my life pretty easy. It makes the life of most of our patients pretty easy too. And I think that's our experience with BPC-157 is if someone's having a problem with healing, or the chronicity of a wound, like if things are just staying a little inflamed and swollen longer than you would like, that is a really good use in our clinic for BPC-157. So hopefully that's just enough information to, to get you out of the confusion associated with this. It's not hard to get. You get it to our clinic. MoabTexas.com, fill out a contact sheet. We should be able to improve the accessibility to peptide therapy with virtual visits. We have Dr. Phillips there who can answer most questions on dosing and how do, how do, how do I continue to dose it up to see an effect in a, outside of the side effect profile, which is what we do, is we guide you through the dosing schedule to make sure that we give you the safest, most efficacious experience possible with the peptides that we've worked really hard to help you have access to. With that being said, I want to thank you so much for your time and attention. Tune into the Zero Downside podcast and our other episodes. We've done a lot of work on peptides this week, and I'm really excited to help you on your healthcare journey with Moab Texas Peptides and our clinic staff, which is fine-tuned and ready to help you. Thank you again so much. Like and subscribe. Hit that notification button, and thank you for your attention. I love you guys.